second part of my talk, I would discuss with you the association of thyroid autoimmunity and other autoimmune associated disorders. These disorders may be endocrine disorders or they may be non endocrine disorders. The principle, or I would say the most known personality with multiple autoimmune endocrine disorders was President John F. Kennedy. He was recognized, and this was, of course, publicity, as a very healthy person when he was elected. But this gentleman was actually suffering from multiple diseases, as shown in his published history, medical history, in the Annals of Internal Medicine. He was suffering of Hashimoto thyroiditis, of Addison disease, and of autoimmune gastritis when he was elected. But this was kept secret, of course, to the public. And this gentleman, as you know, did not die from his autoimmune disorders. He died at the age of 43 due to other circumstances. But this gentleman developed at the age already 13 years autoimmune disorders. He developed Edison disease, adrenal insufficiency, at the age of 29 years. And he developed autoimmune hypothyroidism at the age of 38 years. And he was elected, as you know, in 1960, when he had all these symptoms and signs. So what I'm trying to tell you today is that if you have an autoimmune endocrine disorders, you may become, or you may have several, numerous autoimmune endocrine disorders dealing with autoimmune thyroid disease, type 1 diabetes, adrenal insufficiency, Edison disease. I have several couples coming to my outpatient clinic because the lady is infertile, because she is 25 years old and she has already premature ovarian failure, and as we heard before, there is some homology of the structure of the ovarian surface cell, of the surface of the ovarian cell and the thyroid. And this explains also the simultaneous occurrence of ovarian failure and thyroid failure. And if you look at histology, if you look at the histology of the pancreas, of the thyroid, or other endocrine glands, you will always see the same pathology. Huge infiltration of T cells, activated T cells, B cells, cytotoxic cells leading to destruction of the gland and leading, of course, to gland failure. If you now look at type 1 diabetics, young type 1 diabetics, more than 18%, let's say nearly 20%, so one of five, has also thyroid antibodies. Not only one, probably two, and the more antibodies they have, <coughs> the higher the TSH So it's a clear correlation between patients with type 1 diabetes and thyroid autoimmunity. And this is a, a young lady who came to my outpatient clinic. Her mother was my patient. And we are not treating only the 
patients, we are also treating or offering to treat the whole family. So the lady brought me her daughter and tell me, well, doctor, my daughter has type 1 diabetes. This was recognized by the family physician. So please help me and take care of the lady. She was at that time eight years old. And then a couple of months later, she told me, well, my daughter has no problem at school. She cannot concentrate. She cannot also, she's writing, but I cannot read what she's writing. And she is too nervous. She's sweating the whole time. So I told her, bring me your daughter again. And when she brought me her daughter, it was clear to me that her daughter now is developing autoimmune thyroid disease. So within a couple of months, this young lady developed type 1 diabetes and autoimmune thyroid disease. And you do recognize, I think, every person working in clinical practice recognizes also proptosis and also goiter, as has been mentioned before. So we are dealing with autoimmune thyroid disease, and you do differentiate between a typical phenotype of grave disease with goiter, with T cell infiltration of the thyroid gland, and with stimulation and hypertrophy of the thyroid cells, leading on the long run to release of T4 and T3 from the thyroid. So you have, of course, hyperthyroid. But we also do see in those patients the clinical manifestation and phenotype of autoimmune hypothyroidism due to Hashimoto thyroiditis, starting with, again, a goiter, and you do have T cell infiltration, but these T cells are rather cytotoxic. So you have destruction of the thyroid gland. And at the beginning, release of T4 and T3 from the destruction of the thyroid cells. So in Hashimoto thyroiditis, at the beginning you see a goiter and increased T4 and T3 due to release of these T3 and T4 from the thyroid cells. But it is transient, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, and then T3 and T4 normalize or go below the normal range. Not every pa pa patient or person with Hashimoto develop hypothyroidism, fortunately. And when we are talking about several autoimmune endocrine disorders, Patient with Hashimoto's cluster more with diabetes type 1 than patients with grave disease. So you would tell me, why is this this case? It's a very simple answer. Hashimoto and type 1 diabetes are manifestation of cell-induced autoimmune disease cell-mediated autoimmune disease. What does this mean? Well, very simple. The T cells are responsible. Why? Brave disease, it is a humoral disease. Humoral means antibody-mediated. You are dealing here with TSH receptor antibodies who are causing the disease, stimulating the thyroid cells, while you are here dealing with T cells, which are cytotoxic. So we call this a cell-mediated disease, and we call this a humoral disease, TH2, TH2 reaction, TH1 reaction. And two cell-mediated autoimmune diseases cluster together. Cluster means occur together. And this is one of the explanations why 
Hashimoto occur very often with that one. We did look, I had another color, but this is the risk of including your slides in other <laughs> presentation. Okay, so I'll try to be as clear. Can we dim the light more, please? Is it possible? If it's technically possible. Otherwise, I'll try to move you actually within the slot. We have looked at more than 1,200 patients. We do follow between 1,000 and 1,500 patients a year with autoimmune therapies. So it is easy for us to follow these patients. And the bottom line, the, sh the message of this slide is, if we look at patients with Hashimoto therapies and look at their siblings and children, the risk for developing autoimmune Hashimoto thyroiditis in the siblings and children of patients with Hashimoto is increased 34, 34. In sibling, 20-fold, and children, 32-fold. In children, siblings, and children of great disease, it is increased 6-fold to 8-fold. And if we now go to look at the risk of autoimmune disease in general, it is increased sixfold, and autoimmune endocrine diseases, it is increased twelvefold. So this is why I do offer my patients to bring me their families. I'm not losing my time. I don't want to spend too much time or too much money. But this is my duty, this is my task to inform these patients that the risk is there, is present. And we are dealing with a large number of patients. So it is really my duty to follow not only the patients but also the family. I'm offering this. Not everybody will come, but I'm offering this. Why? Because in Europe, especially in Germany where I'm working, the family doctors always think about money, of course, because they are controlled by the health insurance and they cannot do a lot of diagnostic. I think in your country here also, you cannot spend too much money. You have to certify or to, let's say, explain why you are doing diagnostic. Is it reasonable? At the university hospital, I can offer this. Not a, every family doctor can do screening, can screen the relatives of these patients. If we do this, we do recognize the so-called autoimmune polyglandular syndrome. What does this mean? Autoimmune polyglandular syndrome it is an occurrence of two, of at least two, autoimmune endocrine disorders. We see this in the children, it is the juvenile type, and we see this in the adults. When we see this in the juvenile type, in the children, we see especially hypogonadism, and also destruction of the adrenals, whereas Whereas in the adult type, we see especially type 1 diabetes and autoimmune thyroid disease, and also Addison disease. And of course, the adult type is more prevalent, 1 to 10,000, than the juvenile type, 1 to 100,000. We do differentiate between children, type 1, juvenile type, and the adult type, which is more frequent. And I will give you an idea. We are currently following 228 patients who have the adult type of this autoimmune polyglandular syndrome. This is the largest collective in the world. 75% have the combination autoimmune thyroid disease and type 1 disease, type 1 diabetes. We have also all the first degree relatives. And we have 111 family 
of all the relatives of these patients so we can follow the transmission, the inheritance of the autoimmune disorders. And we do differentiate between the type 2, who all have Addison disease, type 3, autoimmune thyroid disease, and type 1 diabetes, and type 4, if you exclude both types, for example, hypocalcemia with hypoparathyroidism, or hypophysitis, or hypogonadism. Most of the patients have this combination, as the young lady I showed you before. If type 1 diabetes start as first endocrine disease, within 18 years, this is the mean interval, all these patients will develop autoimmune thyroid disease, 97%. So it's only a matter of time, if you follow them, that they are developing another autoimmune disorders. In contrast, if you start with the thyroid, a second autoimmune disorders will occur earlier, 12 years in contrast to 18 years, but only the half of these patients will develop type 1 diabetes. Other halves will develop hypoparathyroidism, hypogonadism, and so on. So this is the clear difference. If you start with diabetes, you will follow with the thyroid. If you start with the thyroid, you can follow with diabetes type 1 only in 50%. If you have both diabetes and hypothyroidism, you will have an increased gluconeogenesis, an increased glycogenolysis, an increased intestinal glucose resorption, and a reduction of the insulin secretion and a reduction of the insulin sensitivity, leading to impaired glucose tolerance and exacerbation and or exacerbation of pre diabetes, meaning that you have to adapt the insulin dose. In contrast, if you don't have hyperthyroidism, but hypothyroidism and type 1 diabetes, you have a decreased hepatic glucose production. You have decreased intestinal glucose resorption. You have decreased insulin requirement. And you have an increased insulin sensitivity. Meaning that you will have an improved pre diabetes. But the problem is, if you have an increased insulin sensitivity, and a decreased insulin requirement, the risk is that you may have hypoglycemia. So again, here you have to adapt your insulin actually dosage. Usually I adapt this for four to six weeks. Once I treat the patients, it's reversible, fortunately. So the hypothyroid become euthyroid, the hyper become euthyroid. But I have to be inform and I have to know this film. Another problem is, and this has been described in the GCNN, many patients with type 1 diabetes are producing antibodies against T4 and T3. So, it was unbelievable for me, I reviewed this article, 92% in type 1 diabetes are developing antibody against FT4 and FT3. And this has been done in a repetitive manner in the year 2005 and in the year 2011 by an Italian group. And I'm editor of the GCNM, and I have received also another paper showing that T4 and T3 antibodies are also demonstrated in other autoimmune endocrine disorders. So antibodies against T4 and T3 may impact, of course, thyroid metabolism and also diabetic metabolism, insulin metabolism, because hypothyroidism, as I told you, has an impact on the insulin resistance. Excuse me. So the question is, a lot of antibody, what is going on here? Why should antibodies be present against several endocrine organs. Why? When I teach at school, at medical school, 
I say to my patients, try to understand. If you understand what is going on, you will keep it for life. You will learn it for life. And if you go to the examination, you are not afraid because you have understand. You have understood what is going on. If you are only learning by heart, without understanding what is going on, you will have problems. If the professor is asking you questions at the medical examination. So try to understand what is going on with me. Everything starts, everything starts during pregnancy. And in a newborn, in the thymus. If you are losing tolerance, if you are losing tolerance to peptides, you will develop memory cells. These cells are so-called T cells, activated cells. And there are the good guys and there are the bad guys. The good guys are the so-called regulatory T cells. And the bad guys are the active effector T cells. So we have two classes of T cells. And a disbalance, a disbalance between T cells and regulatory T cells will lead to the clonal expansion, a clonal expansion of autoreactive T cells. These autoreactive T cells will aggress, will attack the thyroid gland, the pancreas, the adrenal gland, and even the small intestine in celiac disease. This is the common phenomenon. Are you following me? Okay. So you will tell me, why are they aggressing so many glands? Why? Because all these glands are demonstrating, expressing the same peptide on the surface, on the surface of their cells. These are the HLA antigens, the super antigen, DR3, class 2 antigens, DR3 and 4 for diabetes, DR3 and 4 for Addison disease, and homogeneous antigens, DQ2 and 8, very close to DR3 and 4 for the celiac disease. Same story everywhere. These antigens are located in very close interval on the chromosome 6. They are neighbors. They are neighbors antigens. And this explains why actually attack of aggressiveness against one or two HLA antigens will lead to destruction of several glands. One cell, one cell may express two different antigens, like here. This is the so-called antigen presenting cell, APC. An insulin peptide as an antigen and a thyroid peptide, thyroid level. This explains why you may have diabetes and autoimmune thyroid disease in the patients. Or you may have two different cells expressing two different antigens, but they have a common amino acid, here the A, and this amino acid bind to the T-cell receptor and stimulate activity. So either you have one cell expressing two antigens, or you have two cells, but they are both actually stimulating the T-cells with a common amino acids. This is the current theory, explaining why we have several autoimmune endocrine disorders in one patient. This is a patient of mine, back to the practice, 55 years old. He came to me because of Hashimoto, 99. One year later, he developed type 1 diabetes. Two years later, he came with his wife telling me, oh, I cannot have a relationship with my wife. I am also I'm very sad about it. He developed primary hypogonadism with 
very hard monotropic Same year, our genome describes with pain. And two years later, rheumatoid arthritis, 2006. So within seven years, it developed six our genome disorders, cirrhosis the dry side. So I told them, you have children? Yes, I have. Written me your children. His son had a TSH level of 120. I'm not kidding. 120. His daughter had antibodies against TPO and parietal cells antibody, meaning that she had also autoimmune disorders. Do you understand why I'm looking at the family? Are you following me? Okay. So indeed, if I look at my patients and at their relatives, it is like a mirror. It's like a mirror regarding phenotype, regarding occurrence of autoimmune disorders, regarding actually the symptoms. You can actually look at the patients here and their relatives here. Autoimmune gastritis, the prevalence of autoimmune gastritis, a mirror. Celiac disease, autoimmune hepatitis, vitiligo, neurodermitis, alopecia, and so on. Dermatomyositis, rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. Everything is in the genes, colleagues. Everything is in the genes. So, if you bring me a mother and a child, it's completely logical that I see the same phenomenon. And since they have so many symptoms and signs and so many diseases, the patients are depressed, are anxious, the quality of life is miserable in many of these patients. Just ask them the right questions and you get the right answer. And we did this in all these patients, and the rate of depression and anxiety is very high. So what I'm actually looking at is not only patients with autoimmune thyroid disease, but I'm looking at patients who have autoimmune thyroid disease with vitiligo, with rheumatoid arthritis, with chronic autoimmune hepatitis, with autoimmune gastritis leading to pernicious anemia, with patients with myasthenia gravis, and inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's syndrome or like colitis ulcerosa or like celiac disease. So I have to work with other specialties. And we do offer in our clinic a so-called interdisciplinary clinic, meaning that a professor for gastroenterology, endocrinologist, and an immunologist, rheumatologist are sitting together and consulting or counseling patients with these symptoms. And of course, the families. And I think it's worth to invest time explaining this to the patients. And it's also worth to organize meetings to inform also the population. This is what we are doing with our patients' organization. Because autoimmunity, dear colleague, autoimmunity is and stays in the family. So when you say autoimmunity, think family. And this, this is a, a business guy, business gentleman, a chairman of a company who came to me because he had how to, excuse me, hypothyroidism and he developed alopecia areata. And we took also biopsy of his skin and it was a clear infiltration of T cells. And this is fortunately reversible in those patients. Alopecia areata is frequently reversible. This lady, excuse me, this lady had an alopecia totalis, latent, meaning a complete actually loss of her hair. She was 26 or 60 years old, and she was uh, actually preserved uh, her address now, but you say. So she, she was cutting the hair of other people. <laughs> so it was a disaster. And she, this lady had also Hashimoto. So you see the close uh, relationship between autoimmune endocrine diseases and non-autoimmune endocrine disorders. This lady was a stewardess, Lufthansa stewardess, 38 years old, very nice lady. She had dermatomyositis with autoimmune thyroid disease, and unfortunately, 
fact that their maternal osiris leads to death. And this lady died seven years after the occurrence of Hashimoto, unfortunately. This is very frequent in my patient with autoimmune polyglandular syndrome, neurodermitis, and type 1 diabetes. And of course, I see many patients with vitiligo, especially in those patients with this disease. So it is not certain that my patients have numerous antibodies against the thyroid, TPO, thyroglobulin, glutamate, decarboxylase, against the pancreas, parietal cells, KCH receptor, gliadine, or transcritamine in patients with celiac disease, Addison disease, and so on. And many of my patients have celiac disease, meaning that they have destruction of their intestinal villi. The first symptoms is actually diarrhea, T cell infiltration, then destruction actually of the mucosa, and the last stage is a complete atrophy of the intestinal villi, leading also to malabsorption, and this is the antibody testing actually in the mucosa. Many patients also with type 1 diabetes or autoimmune polyglandular syndrome have autoimmune gastritis. This is a study from Belgium showing you also the rate of parietal cell antibody in patients with Hashimoto, 35%. In patients with Graves, 22%. And these patients develop frequently antibody against the intrinsic factor. As you know, the intrinsic factor is important for resorption of vitamin B12. So these patients develop at the beginning autoimmune gastritis and later on pernicious anemia due to malabsorption of vitamin B12, especially patients with Hashimoto. And patients with autoimmune gastritis lose the ability to resorb many compounds. Why? Because they are destroying their gastric mucosa and the gastric cells, the parietal cells are responsible for secreting acidity. Once you have antibody against parietal cells, you cannot actually produce HCL, meaning that your pH in the stomach is now alkaline. And the alkaline pH is actually a problem for resolving compound. So you are having iron, iron, iron deficiency, or you have a malabsorption of your T4 tablets. It's very important. You need a much higher dosage of T4 to get actually your compounds resolved. And indeed, the more problem you have with the morphology of your stomach, the higher your actually T4 actually requirements because you have problem resolving the T4 and this is a study from Siena showing you the correlation between atrophy, mild, moderate, severe and the T4 requirement in those patients. And the problem is that you have a complete destruction of the gastric villi and you have new cells replacing the normal cells and these cells are called neuroendocrine cells. You will tell me why neuroendocrine? Because they are able to produce chromogranin. And chromogranin is elevated, and this is a precancerous state. So you have to perform gastroscopy every year. And when we look at the chromogranin serum level, in our patients with type 1 diabetes, with uh, autoimmune polyglandular syndrome, in Graves, Edison, and Hashimoto, look at the levels. 40% of patients with type 1 diabetes had increased chromogranin A, meaning that a large proportion of these patients had autoimmune gastritis, producing chromogranin, like the patients with typically autoimmune gastritis. So you see the relevance, actually, of 
looking at these antibodies and thinking also about the close relationship of several autoimmune disorders. So when we are talking about thyroid autoimmune disease, and this is a practical recommendation, I'm saying a practical recommendation. Look for serological screening of organ-specific antibodies. If it's positive, we do functional screening. And we do offer, we do offer at our institution serological screening of first degree relatives. I know this might not be possible in each country. This is what we are doing in Germany. And I do offer this to help the general physician to diagnostic these patients. We do the job, we pay for it, and we send the letter, the complete letter, to the GP, informing them about our results. What do we mean with diagnostic screening? Antibodies, of course, against the endocrine glands. Antibodies also against cytochrome P150 enzyme, 21 hydroxylase for Addison disease. We look for the antigen ATPase of the parietal cells, intrinsic factor transcriptaminase. Functional testing means we look if the patients are hypothyroid, if they have hypogonadism and low testosterone level or low estradiol levels. Fasting morning cortisol to exclude Addison disease, glucose for diabetes, renin and aldosterone again to look for Addison disease, ACTH stimulation test if adrenal antibodies are positive, and electrolyte and blood cell counts exclude pernicious anemia. Do we go for molecular testing? Only in juvenile glandular autoimmunity, as you know, the higher gene is positive in those patients, and I'm doing this, of course, at my institution. Otherwise, I thank you so much for your attention. Mm. of 
these medical students. Nevertheless, again, 20% of these students who develop antibody developed Hashimoto thyroiditis permanently with destruction of the thyroid gland. So fortunately, the study was ensured that it was the case. And we did find either biopsy in each pathway because it was a clinical trial and we had a massive T cell infiltration. So no doubt about it, high iodine intake, and this has been shown everywhere, everywhere, is a risk factor for autoimmunity. Also for other autoimmune endocrine diseases, not only for the thyroid. Point three, stress. So I always tell this to my students, if you are sitting beside me at the exams, <laughs> your T cells are very low. Your good guys are very low. Your regulatory T cells, and indeed, this has been shown. So the guy who's depressed has a very low charger of good guys. So stress, stress is also a risk factor. If you move people from Asia to the United States, for example, for immigration, or in Germany, in Germany, we had many people coming from the eastern part of Europe, or from the eastern part of Germany to the western part of Germany, after the war. So we were welcoming a lot of patients. And the eastern part of Germany, the people had their job. They were secure, they were safe. In the western part of Germany, they had to look for jobs. So this was a stress factor. And at that time, 15 years ago, we had a higher prevalence of autoimmune diseases, autoimmune thyroid diseases. So these are possible risk factors to increase autoimmune endocrine disorders, the side of genetics. Did I answer your question? Thank you. Yes, Professor. Professor. Uh, I'm very much uh, in, uh, um, interested in the data that you actually showed us that having one autoimmune disease will eventually lead to all these other autoimmune diseases in the future. Uh, having known that now, is there now a possibility or is it something that we are doing that once we have identified one autoimmune disease, we can already start regulating the immune system, hopefully to prevent the occurrence of other autoimmune diseases in the future. Is there a role, particularly for steroids, among these patients who present to you first with perhaps autoimmune thyroid disease in order to prevent the development of subsequent autoimmune diseases in other organs? And then another one, uh, I'm not sure if it's something that is being done, is there a, a way that a mother who is already identified with autoimmune disease may have some intervention in order for the fetus to actually be prevented from developing any autoimmune disorder in the future? Fantastic. Professor Nimi is a clever person. I like him very much. Very much. I know him since years, but he was still, I think, a young fellow. So Nemi, fantastic, bravo, bravo. <coughs> so let me answer his questions. The first one is, yes, can we, uh, do we have uh, facts? You've already heard this word, facts. This is the main point for me. So do, do we have facts, experimental facts, uh, genetic facts, uh, data telling us this person has a higher risk to develop several autoimmune diseases. Yes, we have, and this is genetics. So we have the so-called HLA alleles, or haplotype. Haplotype is like numerous alleles, like a chain. Because they are, as I told you, they are located together on chromosome six. So if we look at several alleles, we are, tell, we are speaking about haplotype and genotype if we have this on both chromosomes. This is a clear risk factor that a person with one autoimmune endocrine disease will develop two, three, or more. And we do know, like Professor Nami is asking, we are not only dealing with HLA class one, Two, 
But now we are also looking more carefully at the so-called HLA class three. Three. Encompassing the following integers, TNF alpha, tumor necrosis factor. Very important. Heat shock protein, 70 and 90, also put that. And the so-called mean histocompatibility complex type 1. Mika. These genes are located on class 3. And they are increased in patients who are developing autoimmune polyglandular syndrome. And the problem is, unfortunately, they are not only present in the patients, but also in their siblings and children. So it's a clear case of genetics. And this is, so if we are performing, this is why we are looking at all these family to see how prevalent are these genetic factors. And we have also to see not only one relative, but to see all the relatives. Otherwise, you cannot extrapolate about the right number. Another point is, can we do, or do we have intervention? <coughs> Excuse me. If a lady is pregnant and she wants to have, let's say, a normal pregnancy, we always recommend to screen prior to pregnancy, if we can plan pregnancy, it is of course optimal. We do recommend, not only we, the American Thyroid Guidelines, I have been uh, drafting also with them, the guidelines for the American Thyroid Association, published in October in the Journal of Thyroid. They are telling you, if a patient has a history of autoimmune thyroid disease, a history, so for example, they have received uh, radioiodine treatment, or they had uh, Hashimoto thyroiditis, even if the patients are now new thyroid. Just the history of autoimmune thyroid disease with presence of antibody, you always have to be very careful because the titer, the antibodies can disappear and come back again. Because at the beginning of pregnancy, this is recognized, unfortunately, as stress. And many patients, female who become pregnant, receive automatically iodine from their family, from, uh, family physician. And this also boosts autoimmunity. So you have to be careful. A patient with autoimmune thyroid disease or a history should not receive iodine before or during pregnancy. Very important. You should get, let's say, enough uh, fish or iodine uh, uh, rich uh, nutrition, it's fine, but not high dose iodine tablets. This has been shown before. And what are we doing? We are measuring the titer of TSH receptor antibody. The TPO antibody are important, but TSH receptor antibody are even more important. Why? Because they are functional. And we can differentiate between stimulating blocking and neutral antibody. We just had a case report, very nice place, case report in the GCNM in January, showing you that a lady who was hypothyroid, taking 200 microgram of T4, severely hypothyroid, became a baby with neonatal hyperthyroidism. This baby had an APGAR score of two and spent one week at the intensive care unit. Why? Because this lady was developing thyroid stimulating antibody, although she had Hashimoto. And these thyroid stimulating antibody led to severe neonatal hypothyroidism. So again, we say in German, if you plan, it's all if you prevent, it's always better than treat, than manage. Think about it. Thank you.